Jennifer Levy with the Atomic Heritage Foundation. I am here in Florida on December 28, 2017 with Roger Stover. Um, and if my first question is for you to please say your name and spell it. My name is Roger Stover, R-O-G-E-R, last name S-T-O-V-E-R. Uh, can you tell us about when and where you were born and a little bit about your family growing up? Yes, I was born in uh, Naperville, Illinois. It's a suburb west of uh, Chicago. And uh, I lived in a small town. It was a small town of 5,000 at the time. And um, it was a uh, rather normal uh, life growing up. And uh, I moved when I was about 18 years old and uh, never came back to the area. What kind of an education did you get, both in high school and in college, when okay. you decided um, you were interested in nuclear? Uh, yes, I, I was in, uh, graduated from high school, and then went to uh, Purdue University for a uh, BS in mechanical engineering. Then I went to uh, MIT for a master's in nuclear engineering, and then a doctorate in uh, nuclear engineering back at Purdue. And the thing that got me interested in nuclear was when I was drafted into the U.S. Army in 1957, and uh, we were sent over to the Anahuitac uh, 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 testing grounds for the bomb tests in the Marshall Islands. So can you talk a little bit then about being drafted into the Army and the, your work in Anahuitac? Yes, uh, I was assigned to Army Chemical Center in Edgewood, Maryland, which is just north of Baltimore. And one of our assignments there, working with uh, civilians, was to go over to the um, Marshall Islands to Anahuitac Atoll on Operation Hardtack 1, which occurred from roughly April 1958 through August 1958. And then we were also assigned and sent to Hardtack 2, which was in the Nevada test site from September to October 1958. And there was a rush on at this time to complete all of the nuclear testing before the end of October when Eisenhower had signed an agreement with the Russians not to perform any uh, nuclear weapons tests. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, in, in a wee talk, and what it was like to be sent out there? Um, how did you feel about being assigned to work on nuclear testing? Well, the first thing was it was very exotic to be sent to a Pacific Islands, island, and uh, when we, we got there, it was very accommodating. Uh, Holmes and Narver out of Los Angeles was the lead contractor for taking care of people there, and so they had large tents for us to live in. They had excellent food. We had uh, steak dinners every Wednesday night and prime rib every Saturday night. Uh, there was a large PX there. And uh, also there was excellent scuba diving. The, the coral reefs were, were just fabulous. So that part of it was extremely uh, enjoyable. Uh, but in fact, the work itself was, was enjoyable. Uh, what kind of work were you doing exactly in terms of the, the testing? Yes, uh, what we were doing is measuring the radiation effects from the, uh, from the shots, from the bomb blasts. These are mostly uh, hydrogen bomb tests, uh, shots, as opposed to uh, Nevada, where they're normally the, uh, the uh, uranium uh, shots. And uh, what we would do is uh, set out passive detectors before the shot and then retrieve them after the shot. We would take uh, foils out of the detectors and put them into Geiger, Geiger counters and then measure the, uh, the radiation, the neutron and the gamma uh, rays from the, uh, from the weapons test. Most of the shots were um, barge shots on the water. There were several under the water, and then there were also a few land shots on some parts of the atoll. And normally, we were about 30 miles away from the, uh, from the blast. So um, on any given day when the shot was to go off, they announced it on the PA system. There was a regular countdown. And then just before the shot went off, you turned your back because the, the light pulse was so intense. 
then right after that you could turn around we had on goggles and you you felt the uh, the pulse of the uh, the light intensity of the heat you felt that pulse immediately and then about uh, perhaps five or ten minutes later you felt the blast effect and then about 15 20 minutes later you saw the uh, lagoon uh, recede about a, to a depth of about 20 or 30 feet and then uh, over the next hours, it gradually came back in. So how did you feel the first time you saw a nuclear test? Well, uh, seeing a, uh, a nuclear bomb explode was uh, completely overwhelming. As I, as I said, we were 30 miles away, but we could feel the heat pulse. And the, uh, the shock wave was uh, sufficient that uh, it, could, it almost uh, blew you over in, unless you were you're standing uh, uh, strong with your, your legs thoroughly attached to the ground. So it was, it was just overwhelming to see. And we saw about uh, probably eight or ten shots in uh, the Marshall Islands. The biggest one was about uh, ten uh, megatons, as opposed to the, uh, the weapon over um, Japan was on the order of, I think, about ten or fifteen kilotons. So it was a, a major shot. And what was the purpose of the testing that you were doing um, with the, to test the radiation? Well, the, the purpose of the government was very interested in finding out what the effect was on contamination, and also they wanted to know uh, how far the, uh, the effects of the blast uh, in terms of radiation, neutrons, and uh, gamma rays uh, surrounding, so they were interested in plotting this kind of uh, information distance from the from the blast, and also the effect on ships. They had ships in the lagoon, so they wanted to see what the effect would be on the ships, and uh, also um, on the effect of the contamination, how it could be contained, and how far it would uh, float away. Were there any ever were there any health concerns for you and your fellow soldiers, or were you far enough away that that wasn't considered to be an issue? Uh, in, in terms of uh, radiation effects and uh, impact uh, upon the people there, as I said, we were 30 miles away, but you had to be careful about fallout. And I think <clears throat> at one point there was a concern for, uh, for fallout. What we did was we wore film badges. And these were um, measured, <clears throat> they, these were measured once a week. And uh, if you exceeded five Rankins, then you had to leave the, uh, the test site. You were sent back home. Now, uh, a normal X-ray would probably be about uh, maybe 10 millirems. So five Rankins was quite a bit of radiation. Now, um, one, um, one uh, of my friends, one of the soldiers, serving with me had just gotten married before he came. So after about one month, his film badge mysteriously read five Rankins. So he had to be sent back home. So there was always some speculation that um, he wanted to uh, go back to his newly married bride instead of staying there for another two or three months. But uh, other than that, there wasn't any, <clears throat> any concern about uh, radiation. So you, you learned how to read the film badge, and you learned how to work with Geiger counters and the other testing equipments. Right. We had uh, about uh, 10 Geiger counters inside of a converted uh, semi-trailer. And so after the blast, we would go out and retrieve the detectors and take them apart and take out the little metal disks and um, put them into the Geiger counters and uh, measure the radioactivity of the various metals and uh, the uh, radiation levels of the various uh, metals uh, helped us determine the, uh, the neutron uh, field, how strong it was, and also the effect of the gamma rays. <clears throat> did, did it look to you like the Marshall Islands, like any we talked, changed from the atomic bombing tests over the time you were there, or did it mostly look like it stayed the same? Well, of course, the island where we were, it stayed the same. Uh, the surrounding islands, uh, there were a few land shots, so they actually set the weapon on, the, uh, on a part of the atoll, and of course that was blasted 
with a large crater, and then there were also uh, shops inside the lagoon, and some of those were underwater, and so that left a large crater in the lagoon. The lagoon in the uh, Marshall Islands, uh, and we talked, uh, was not that deep, perhaps, uh, you know, 50 feet or so, so it was quite notice noticeable. And as we went around in the, the LST, that's how we put the detectors out. That's a landing barge from World War II. And uh, you could see, uh, we, we never got very close to any of the damaged parts of the island because of the radioactivity involved. Did you meet any of the native Marshall Islanders, or, they, or had they all been uh, they, relocated? Yes, all of the uh, native people had been uh, evacuated, so we did not meet any of them. Do you know, are those, is, is anyone we talk inhabitable today, or is the radiation still too high? Uh, they took some uh, people back to Bikini, I think in 1980, and it seemed like the radiation levels were uh, low enough to exist. But what happened was the, um, the radioactivity was absorbed into, I believe, the, uh, the palm trees or the banana trees. And so it, it, um, it uh, produced a, um, an environment where they couldn't live. So they were taken back off. And I don't know what the present state is now. And as far as I know, there aren't any people back in the Marshall Islands, or in Anahuitac at least. And the ships that were used um, to test to see the impact of the bombings mm -hmm. on the ships, were those left in the water there or were they taken back and examined? Uh, they were taken back and um, after every uh, test the uh, ships were washed down and decontaminated. So as far as I know there are no ships left in the uh, lagoon. Now it, it may be different in Bikini, there were also tests there and uh, I was not uh, over at that part of the uh, the testing, only at the Anahuitac. Did you have to work on the ships, washing them down, or was that other people's duties? Uh, we, we spent one day on a ship, but we were just there as uh, as guests. And I don't remember why we were there, but no, I, I did not do any con decontamination of the ships. So can you talk about witnessing the tests in Nevada? Was that right after? That was right after. The yes, it was office. right after, and uh, we uh, we packed up the trailer and it was shipped back to the states, and then uh, we went to um, to Nevada to the test site, and again uh, we lived in um, four man trailers. It was at Camp Mercury, which is about 70, 80 miles outside of uh, Las Vegas. And these were a series of um, some balloon shots and some uh, surface shots and also uh, some underground shots. They were much lower yield. They were on the order of maybe uh, one kiloton at, at, at the greatest. And uh, we, we performed the same uh, uh, regimen. We took the detectors out the day before the shot and then after the shot we went back and retrieved them and took them back into our labs and uh, counted the samples. Uh, one interesting um, story, being out in the desert and we had access to jeeps, so uh, being uh, young men, uh, guys like to take the jeeps and go riding out in the desert. Well, two of the uh, guys I worked with did that one day, and they found themselves about a mile away from a balloon floating in front of them with a, a closed gate. So they had to call security to get through the gate quickly and get out, and this occurred about one hour before the balloon shot. So they were very fortunate to, uh, to get out quickly. Can you explain what you mean by a balloon shot? Yes, what they, what they did was they wanted to test the, uh, the effect of a weapons explosion in the air. So they would attach the weapon to a balloon and then float it up into the air, perhaps 500, 1,000, 2,000 feet, and then it was exploded from there. Since the Nevada shots were um, smaller in terms of the, the destructive power, were you closer or were you still 30 miles away? Uh, we were closer. We were on the order of about uh, 10 miles away, yes. 
and the 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 blast effect and the uh, the uh, the re the heat effect was uh, much less. So, how did your response to witnessing the tests change over time since you went from seeing the larger hydrogen to the smaller fission tests? Well, it, it was just uh, more a um, reaction to the. Um, the, the size of, of the weapon, you know, and the destructive force of the, the larger megaton blasts as opposed to the, uh, the smaller shots, but uh, still it was all overwhelming to uh, see these uh, weapons uh, being uh, detonated. The smaller ones still was an the overwhelming experience? The, the smaller ones were still quite overwhelming, certainly is. And in terms of uh, contamination, the uh, the balloon shots, the contamination was fairly well contained because they did a, a good job of studying the wind currents. But there was one shot where there is some low level of radiation uh, drifted off towards Los Angeles, so that was noticeable. But it was only only one, so I guess that was a, a positive note, and it was very low radiation level. Was that reported on in the media, or did the military try to keep that? I'm not sure. I, I uh, looked at it in Wikipedia just yesterday, and I, I noticed that. I, I don't remember that at all when I was there. You don't remember being notified about the... No. No, not at all. No. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk about it still being overwhelming as a small smaller fission, because I know it's hard for people today to understand just... Fission ones were also very large, but the hydrogen bombs ones seem even bigger, and so it's all a matter of scales. But of course, the fission ones were still very large, destructive power. Right. Yeah. With the hydrogen bombs, of course, you were much further away, 30 miles away, and so with the smaller uh, atomic bombs, so-called, uh, you were closer, but they were still um, gigantic in size and effect. Can you talk uh, also about what other security precautions were taken? Um, I, I assume, no, were there civilians ever allowed to witness any of these tests as journalists or, or as um, experts? Right. Um, both Operation Hardtack 1 and 2 was a combination of uh, many government um, services, and they were military, and I would say mostly uh, civilian contractors were there. And I would guess, and there were a lot of photographers certainly there, because you can go online now and you can see um, uh, movies of all of these uh, these shots. And in fact, I was going through some of the films about a year ago, and I saw a couple of my friends that I worked with on the beach. At Dan Weetok? Yeah, Dan Weetok, yes. Yes, there were a lot of civilian contractors there. And um, the story was, that, well, they were there for longer than just the test because they were also working Bikini and also Johnson Island. There were some uh, rocket shots off of Johnson Island. And uh, so they could be there from 12 to 18 months. Now, back then, there is the federal liar, the, the IRS code said that if you were out of the country, I think 12 or 18 months, then you didn't have to pay income taxes. So they tried to stay 18 months. It, it was a real tough uh, haul for some of those civilians, but they had been there quite a while. So how many people were in your specific Army unit working on the nuclear test? There were about uh, 15 of us assigned from Army Chemical Center. And why do you think that you and the others were selected for this kind of, uh, of work? Well, we were selected because uh, at the Army Chemical Center we were doing uh, uh, radiation effects in buildings and we had concrete structures and we would put a, um, a radioactive source in one room and then we would go into the other rooms and measure the uh, radiation field. So we had experience with uh, measuring uh, radiation with these Geiger counters and uh, so they wanted uh, another way of measuring the uh, the blast effects, the radiation effects from these shots. So we were just one way of measuring. And there were other ways of measuring too, but ours was a rather simple way of uh, passive detectors, putting them down before the shot and then retrieving them after the shot. They also had online 
uh, monitors stationed around, but sometimes they did not survive. So it was important to have many ways of measuring the radiation effects. And when you were drafted, did you want to go to the Army Chemical Center, or was that um, something the Army picked for you to do? Well, there are two parts of that. Uh, when I was drafted, I did not want to go into the Army. And uh, then the second thing was, after basic training, um, because of my background, I had already uh, uh, obtained the uh, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. They uh, sent uh, all the uh, scientific personnel, trained personnel, to uh, various technical Army bases throughout the country, and one of them was Army Chemical Center. And it was quite a good experience there. So though you hadn't wanted to be drafted, in the end, it, it worked out very well. It's like a lot of things in life, you, uh, you don't look forward to them, but then you experience them and you look back upon them, and it was really uh, uh, a, a good experience. For instance, uh, there was time to, uh, to take uh, courses from USAFI, United States Arms Forces Institute, and so I took a Russian course and I took a German course. We were close to Baltimore, so we could go into Baltimore and play a contract, con contract bridge. And uh, we were close to Washington, D.C., and it was uh, really an interesting place to visit. We went to a session of Congress once, and that was impressive to see these men who were uh, making decisions about my life in, in the service, so that was very impressive. So it was uh, a very, very good two years. What was your rank when you were in the Army? I was uh, SP4 was, was my rank. Started out as a private, of course. Um, and when you were in Nevada, was there any concern about health effects from the tests in the surrounding communities, or were the tests all very far from any um, towns? Well, the tests were about uh, 80 or 90 miles from Las Vegas. And uh, I'm sure there were some concerns, but uh, they weren't uh, revealed to us, and we didn't read about any of them. And we went into Las Vegas every weekend to uh, play the slot machines, and uh, we didn't encounter any uh, obvious opposition to the tests. Although, I, as I look back upon it, there was a lot of opposition in the newspapers, but we didn't have any personal contact with that. Do you have any specific impressions of a particular test, either at any talk or Nevada? Well, the, uh, I, I guess the most impressive test was the uh, shot called Oak, and that was the one that was about 10 megatons. And I think that was the one where I experienced this extreme uh, heat uh, pulse immediately after the shot is like uh, stepping out into the blazing sun. And then the shock wave after that, about uh, five or ten minutes later, which almost uh, blew you to the ground. So that was probably the most impressive, and it just covered the complete horizon. It was just uh, enormous. So um, when the tests, the tests were ended because of the agreement that was signed, were you still in the Army at that point? I was still in the Army at that point, yes. and. Um, we, uh, we continued our, um, our measurements uh, in, uh, in concrete buildings after that, but uh, that was as far as it went. Although we, we did uh, do some um, measurements on our, our, our Geiger counters, and we went to various labs. We went to Los Alamos to a small test reactor, and we tested some of our uh, detectors there to see if they were uh, normalized correctly, but and we also went to um, Brookhaven National Laboratories and also checked some of our uh, detect detection devices. But otherwise, we were uh, out of the uh, the game after that. How did you find Los Alamos when you went? Well, it was really interesting. It was um, about a we got there about a year after they had opened up the gates. And so the word was that all of the surrounding communities were antagonized by that because they got all these wild young 
kids from the scientific community infiltrating their communities and raising a ruckus, so they didn't like the fact that they had opened up the gates. Uh, it was uh, very quiet at that time, and we stayed at a, uh, a boys' school, which had been converted into a uh, motel, and it was old and rustic and uh, wood beams, and it's still there today. I went back last year and, uh, and looked at it and looked in one of the rooms where I stayed. And so it was a very pleasant community at the time. Do you remember the name of the build that you stayed in? Was it Fuller Lodge? Or? Uh, Four Lodge, it sits on top of a hi small hill and it's right in downtown. And I don't remember the name of it, but it still takes guests right now. Although I think part of it is uh, it's right next to the museum. Is that the place, Four Lodge? Is that what it's called now? I, I believe that's Four Lodge. But it was a boys' school back then, and they, they took it over and converted it to a motel. And we had a visit from the, I think it was the Queen of Greece at the time, and she came to town. That was in 1958, and they had a parade for her downtown in Los Alamos. Wow, why did the Queen of Greece come? I don't know why she came. <laughs> Maybe they were uh, looking for money. I, I don't remember why. Or it might have been the Queen of Spain, one of the two. And how did you find Brookhaven? Brookhaven, I don't have much of a memory because I was only there uh, a couple of days. And it was out in Long Island, of course. And uh, I, I don't have uh, much memory of, of Brookhaven. Well, is there anything else you want to say about your time in the Army or working on the nuclear tests? No, I think that's that's all. It was just uh, an experience that uh, few people will, will ever get to see, and I hope no one will ever see it again. But it was uh, was impressive, and I was glad that I was able to go there. Okay, so I guess we'll move on to your later career then for the Army. Mm -hmm. So when you got out of the Army, um, did you go straight to do graduate work? When I got out of the Army, I uh, went straight to uh, MIT and, uh, and got a master's degree in uh, nuclear engineering. And then I went to work at Argonne National Laboratories, where I was a uh, reactor supervisor for what's called a, a fast zero power reactor. And the way it worked was it was like two bookends, and it was packed full of uh, highly enriched U-235, and to make the reactor critical, you just push the bookends together on, on a table, on uh, two flatbeds, and then it went critical and you made measurements, and then when you wanted to stop the uh, re reaction, then you just pulled the table apart. So there wasn't any radio radioactivity involved, but what was involved was a lot of uh, highly enriched U-235 metal plates which had to be controlled, and they were put into the, um, the bookends with um, baskets, long baskets about this long and about this, this square. So there was uh, a rigorous control of where all these highly enriched U-235 plates were. And um, during that time, I spent um, about three or four months out at uh, the um, it was in, um, let's see, Idaho, the n nuclear test site there, and we had a uh, low-power reactor there called, uh, well, it was EBR-1 was, was one that was also called Zero-Power Reactor 1. And I went out there and as a, uh, as a trainee to see how to operate and supervise a reactor, then I came back and was reactor supervisor for what was called Zero Power Reactor 3, CPPR 3. Did that for three years. And then um, I took uh, several trips around the world, and during that one trip I stopped in Rawalpindi, Pakistan, at Gordon College, and they wanted a math and physics instructor. So I was very interested in living abroad for one year, so after I left Argonne, I went and taught physics in Rawalpindi Gordon College for one year, and then came back 
and then started my uh, doctorate at uh, Purdue University. And uh, then in 1968, when I graduated, I went to uh, Westinghouse Nuclear Fuel Division in Pittsburgh, where we uh, manufactured nuclear fuel for uh, the Westinghouse power reactors. And this was uh, using uh, computer analysis to determine where to put the, uh, the fuel elements. And each reactor had on the order of about 200 fuel elements. And you could place them in various parts of the core depending upon their enrichment and uh, how much energy had been taken from them. And you did that so that you could level out the, uh, the neutron field inside the reactor vessel so that you didn't uh, prematurely uh, burn out any of the fuel assemblies or even the vessel itself. And then uh, after that, I decided that I wanted to go out west, so um, I transferred out to um, Hanford. And at, at that time, Westinghouse also had the contract for, for Hanford, so it was called Westinghouse Hanford. And out there, we were associated with, uh, well, to get back to Pittsburgh, those were all water reactors, water moderators. And then in uh, Hanford, the uh, reactor out there was a um, sodium-cooled power reactor. So uh, I was responsible for a group that did the uh, thermal hydraulic calculations on this uh, reactor out there. After that, um, my, um, my wife's mother was back in um, Tennessee, so she wanted to go back to be with her. She was ill, so um, I applied to Oak Ridge National Laboratories. and. Um, took a position there as a manager of, um, of a shutdown. Well, there was one operating reactor and about three shutdown reactors, so we did some operating on a, uh, on a operating reactor. Um, it, was a little, it was a little ball of highly enriched U-235, and so you could perform some experiments with it. You could also hoist it up in the air, and then there were three shutdown reactors. They were water reactors, experimental reactors. And it took a long time. Uh, it takes a lot of work when you have a shutdown reactor because they still contain uh, uranium inside, uranium vessels. And there's a lot of water and it tends to seep out so you have to be careful and monitor all of the um, instrumentation to make sure that they're shut down correctly, uh, maintained correctly. And the idea is to uh, eventually uh, restore them to uh, uh, green green surface and get rid of everything, but it takes a long time. It's called uh, the uh, deconstruction, uh, de uh, demolition of these reactors. And as far as I know, a lot of them are, are still there. So, and that's when uh, that finished my uh, nuclear career after about 35 years in the nuclear industry. Wow, that's quite a career. Well, thank you. It was quite varied and uh, enjoyable. I guess to go back a little bit earlier in your career, mm -hmm. um, can you talk about what it was like to see the EVR-1, the Experimental Greener Reactor 1 in Idaho? Well, I, um, I didn't operate the reactor, but I went over there several times just to uh, look at it. And of course, the interesting thing was um, how all the uh, instrumentation was analog and had motors whirring and you had to feed, feed in uh, paper and uh, sometimes the photomultiplier tubes didn't work and so it was like changing light bulbs. You had to go to the lockers and put in uh, new, new bulbs and uh, so it was um, somewhat of a... Um, well, compared to today's uh, equipment, it was um, very backward, as I remember, but it was the best we had. And of course, EBR-1 was the first reactor pr to produce electricity, and they produced a light bulb, uh, turned on a light bulb, as I remember, the first time. So. Um, and at Argonne, when you were working on the U-235 reactor, uh, Talk a little bit about the implications of that reactor. What were the research goals of that? The um, the uh, 
fast reactor was, um, as they say, was Eric. Well, wasn't any reason, wasn't any need for a, for a cooling because there wasn't any power. It's just a zero power. And it, it was mostly to calibrate analytical uh, uh, computer models just to see if you could you could calculate um, what what the uh, radiation field was, how well you could calculate. Uh, how much uranium U-235 was necessary to produce criticality. They would um, put the reactor on very short uh, power excursions. And so that was important to be able to calculate uh, how quickly the nu neutron field multiplied. And so that, that required uh, a lot of uh, data. And uh, that was part of it. And uh, also uh, a, uh, a side effect or a non-scientific effect was we used to uh, put our, insert our own pieces of material into the reactor and I irradiated a silver dollar, which I still have, and it has a very low level of radiation. But it was mostly to uh, calibrate uh, computer models. That's very interesting. So I guess this was some early computer work that was being done. Right, yeah. What was it like to live out of Hanford? Um, I know Hanford site is quite large and mm -hmm. a little bit away from the Tri-Cities area. Well, uh, the Hanford site is located north of the Tri-Cities, uh, Richland, Kenwick, and Pasco. It takes about uh, 20, 25 minutes to get there. And you had to go through security gates at all times, of course. But it was a very pleasant area to live, uh, Washington State, because you had this, the, the uh, Columbia River, confluence of the Columbia River and the Snake River. So in the summer, there was a lot of uh, boating and fishing. Uh, that was the high desert, and uh, the area got very hot in the summer. It got up to 95, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But the Columbia River was cool, so people would, you could go out boating and uh, go swimming, cool off. A lot of mountains around there, so there was a lot of good hiking, a lot of good skiing. Uh, if you liked hunting, there was some um, good hunting. So it was a very pleasant place to live in, in, uh, in some aspects. On the other hand, it was not very beautiful to behold to the eye because it was a lot of uh, brown and desert and there were many stories of uh, people that were going seeking employment and they would come out with their wives and they would land at the airport and they would immediately turn around because their wives saw all the uh, the sage and the brown they say I don't want to be buried in the desert take me back home so they would turn around and uh, go home and in the spring and the fall the uh, the sagebrush would just roll in off of the off the uh, the desert, the high plains, and it would clog the streets sometimes and your your sidewalk, and you never had enough water for your lawn, so you were constantly uh, watering your lawn. It was very dry, but otherwise it was a very pleasant environment. There were a lot of uh, wineries along the uh, Yakima River, uh, probably uh, stretched from Seattle to the Tri Cities. That probably are right now probably 60 or 70 wineries, so that was pleasant if you and enjoyed uh, drinking wine, and it was um, a very sunny environment, and uh, it was very pleasant living. And what about uh, living at Oak Ridge? Were you living in Oak Ridge, or did you live in one of the surroundings? Uh, I lived in Knoxville, and uh, commuted into uh, Oak Ridge. And uh, in Knoxville, I lived along the uh, the Tennessee River, so that was uh, pleasant. And uh, Oak Ridge was a uh, small town atmosphere at the time, and uh, there is the Oak Ridge uh, Playhouse, which uh, we regularly attended. And when you went there, you could uh, see, and in some sense, smell the old scientists because they wore all their old. Uh, top coats and their, their jackets and they were kind of musty and uh, it, was, it was a very pleasant uh, environment to, uh, to live in Oak Ridge at the time. 
And were there any differences among the different national laboratories that you worked in over the course of your careers? Did they all have slightly different specialties? Let's see, differences between the laboratories. Um, I, I would say they, they were populated by the uh, same types of personnel. The, um, the geography of the, uh, the places was quite different. For instance, Aragon was located on an old estate from, I think, the Morton uh, family in Chicago, and so they had left all their white deer there. So you had to be careful as you drove around Aragon to, uh, to not hit the deer, and I think they're still there. And um, Oak Ridge was, um, was quite pleasant. There were hills surrounding it, uh, a little colder at, at times. Uh, Washington State, as I say, I didn't notice so it, at, at, at Hanford. Uh, just a different and desert environment, but um, as they say, they were the same uh, types of personalities and scientists at uh, the various lo locations. So I can't really see a lot of difference between them. What about security? Were, was the security pretty tight at all of those places? Security was always tight. You needed to wear a badge, and when you went into town for lunch or something, they were always asked to uh, hide your badge so that no one would find it. And there are different levels of security. For instance, at, at Oak Ridge, uh, we were in the, um, the so-called commercial reactor part of it, some research, but we were also close to uh, Y-12, which is where the weapons uh, parts were and I had occasion to go over there several times and security was very high at, at Y-12. We had part of one of our reactors stored in there. So one of my jobs was to go over there and check to see that it was still there about once every six months. And uh, the security, of course, was much tighter getting into uh, to Y-12. Did you know anybody who worked in the Manhattan Project? No, I no, I didn't know anyone who worked in the Manhattan Project. No, I didn't. No. Did you ever see the K-25 plant? Yes, I did. Uh, I went there while it was still operating, and then I've been there several times since, and every time I've been there over the years, you see fewer and fewer buildings as they demolish the site, and I think it's almost completely demolished now, and uh, it's possible to uh, go there. There's a lookout site, and you can look over all of it. And I think they, uh, they you can drive your car through most of the, uh, the uh, K-25 uh, uh, area now. What was it like to be there when it was still in operation? I, I know it was an enormously large plant. Well, it was overwhelming in size, of course, and uh, they rode bicycles inside. It was, it was so large. And uh, my, my contact there was very peripheral. I think we just went there once or twice. And um, it was um, just uh, overwhelming, the, uh, the size of the, facil the, the facility, yeah. So you've worked on a number of different kinds of nuclear reactors. Um, what do you see as the future of nuclear energy today? Well, I, I see it's one part of the, um, the uh, energy uh, future. Uh, there's a lot of solar, there's a lot of wind. Uh, coal is still important, but uh, nuclear is still an important part because for one great benefit, it's uh, zero contamination. There's no contamination at all from a nuclear power plant. So I think it has to be considered as a uh, energy source for the United States and the rest of the world. The big problem with nuclear power right now is the cost. It's very expensive, and so it takes uh, planning commissions to uh, sell to the uh, state uh, regulatory groups to um, raise the money to build and operate these, uh, these nuclear plants. But once they're built and operating, then they're very, very efficient. 
And uh, as they say, there is uh, no contamination of the environment, so it's what should be considered one of the clean sources of, uh, of energy along with uh, wind and solar and, uh, and hydro. So how do you feel about the controversy around the use of nuclear reactors with some of these concerns over Fukushima and other issues? Well, Fukushima worked correctly and the reactor shut down correctly. The only mistake was that they just built it too low and so the water inundated all of the safety systems. And so the lesson is, and they've uh, started uh, using the uh, information from, from that event by building things higher and building higher walls to prevent uh, such a uh, catastrophe from occurring again. So uh, they've taken into into account as one thing about science is uh, science is not always accurate, but they learn from their mistakes and then they build upon and correct the mistakes and, and move forward and make things better. Definitely. So the reactors that you worked on over your career, were they, they were nuclear power reactors or nuclear weapons related reactors? Well, they were both. At, uh, at Westinghouse Electric, they were all uh, um, power reactors producing around um, 1,100 megawatts of electricity. And uh, the uh, reactor out in, uh, in Hanford was an experimental breeder reactor. It was uh, a fast reactor, so-called fast reactor, sodium cooled. And it uh, breeded, um, er, you took uranium-235 and out of that you got plutonium-239 and you could um, uh, recycle that into new fuel and so it bred its own fuel so it could continue on. The, the problem with sodium is it's very um, uh, not only toxic but it's uh, uh, it can eat into metals so you have to be very careful how you handle sodium. So I think that was one of the problems with a uh, breeder reactor. Also at the time, as I remember, um, the, uh, the president Jimmy Carter shut down the interest in using plutonium because of the uh, fear of, of it um, being spread throughout the world. And so he wanted to stop all programs associated with plutonium-239, so that led to the eventual demise of the uh, breeder fast reactor. And then the reactors in, um, in uh, Oak Ridge and in uh, X in uh, the ORNL, the laboratory itself, some of those were used to produce small amounts of U-235, but most of that was produced at the gaseous diffusion plants, and so they were just used for research purpose. So is a particular type of reactor that you see as being the most promising for nuclear power reactors going forward? Well, the most... Uh, used reactor right now and the, and the easiest one to build and operate are the water-cooled reactors. Uh, there are uh, better designs in terms of safety which will require more development and those are the gas-cooled reactors and there are none operating right now. I think uh, South Africa perhaps has worked on them. But the advantage is when they, when they heat up too much, they just shut down automatically and they use gas and they use small pebbles of uranium-235. So that is probably quite promising. But uh, right now, I think the, uh, the main interest uh, is in the water-cooled reactors. So we're doing an educational project now on um the Manhattan Project's legacy at Hanford, specifically the environmental legacy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, there, there was um, a lot of uh, con ground contamination because um, wastes from the um, reactors, production reactors, uh, was, buried in, was buried in tanks for the most part, and a lot of these tanks have leaked. There was also other res residual contamination which was on the surface, but it was mainly the, uh, the contamination of the tanks into the, uh, into the ground some 30 or 40 feet. 
Now, most of those tanks were maybe um, maybe a thousand, two thousand feet from the Columbia River, but there are models that show that the uh, contamination, ground contamination, gradually leaks into the Columbia River. So that's always been a concern and still is a concern. The Columbia River is uh, monitored very carefully now for, um, for contamination. Also, the water supply for the Tri-Cities, a lot of that came from the uh, Columbia River. So the water supply was monitored, I think, on a, on a monthly basis, and that information was available to the, uh, the citizens who, who lived in the Tri-Cities area. And since then, they've uh, moved a lot of that uh, liquid waste in single-walled tanks into double-walled tanks to prevent any further uh, uh, contamination into the soil. And eventually, they want to um, reprocess all of that waste and uh, get rid of it. But it's uh, a very difficult process. There are so many thousands of gallons. And the other concern was the air contamination from the, um, from the chimneys. And uh, I don't know how or why it happens, but every once in a while there would be a puff of radioactivity going out. And the prevailing winds took it to Spokane, which is to the east of the Tri-Cities. And so there, is a, there was, and I think there still is, a, a group there called Doctors Against Radiation. And so they would weekly and monthly um, post these stories about how Spokane was being contaminated by all the, uh, the pus of radiation that came out of the chimneys at the uh, production reactors. And I'm, I'm not familiar with the level of contamination, but as I remember, it was really quite low and not of concern, but it, it was a constant process and they wanted to shut down uh, the whole Hanford site. And they, they still do, and they're still after the government to, uh, to um, clean it up as quickly as possible. And the cleanup efforts are still continuing on today. They're still continuing on today, right. Um, was the relationship between the Hanford site and the Tri-Cities community generally positive? I always thought it was very positive because it uh, produced uh, a great amount of employment. So I don't know that there was a lot of uh, local uh, uh, opposition to, uh, to the Hanford site. So we're also doing another project on Oak Ridge and its legacy of innovation from the Manhattan Project through today. Um, can you talk a little bit about the innovative work that you saw going on at Oak Ridge over your time there? Well, uh, I, I've been gone from Oregon for about 17 years. Uh, uh, sorry, Oak Ridge for, for about 17 years. Uh, th there were several things that I, I remember since then, though. Uh, one project they were working on was um, insulation for homes. And so they were developing ultra methods of insulation and how to, to measure it. So you could cheaply insulate your home and reduce um, e energy consumption. Uh, another project they had was um, Oak Ridge was very involved in removing um, high enriched uranium from uh, many countries in the world from reactors and storage. So there was a group that worked um, pr probably under the radar, and not a lot of people knew about it, to um, find the uh, enriched uranium, where it was located, and then to work with the various governments to get it moved to a safe location. And there was a lot of very close interaction with people at Oak Ridge and, uh, for instance, the Russian government to remove a lot of that, that uranium and put it in safe places. And a lot of it, I think, was brought back to the United States. So it, uh, was quite an involved process. And people that were in it didn't talk a lot about it. So, and of course they wanted to do that so that it wouldn't be uh, known to uh, potential uh, people who wanted to get, you know, grab some of the stuff, you know. So those were two programs that I remember. But, but what they've tried to do, and I guess all national labs try to do the same thing, is get programs that can spin off into um, uh, in industrial applications 
and the commercial applications. And Congress is always very interested in that kind of thing. So if you can take some research money and then start a company which sells that and produces a profit, then that's very interesting. So uh, Oak Ridge has partnered with Tennessee, University of Tennessee and a lot of other universities to, um, to put together such a program. And I think Argonne does the same thing and uh, Los Alamos and the, all the labs do the same thing. Self-preservation, I guess. So the national laboratories still continue to be real centers of scientific and engineering? Education. Yes, I think they will, yes. Although the funding for uh, re research has gone down a lot, so that's, that's a concern, a real concern. But it's also gone down in corporations, too. Do you think it's important for the funding to be continued to help with the innovation? Well, of course, I'm biased, but yes, I, I think it's very important to uh, continue funding for, for research. Well, that was, that was uh, extremely interesting. I, I, as I said, taught physics there, teaching in, it was in Islamabad. And um, there was a college, Gordon College, there had been established about 1890. And um, a lot of the students were uh, from the countryside. So they were somewhat naive and, and perhaps uh, not very mature. And I remember the, uh, the classroom where I taught, it was so hot there most of the time that um, there were um, windows, uh, kind of like a, um, a red roof in motel where the doors open onto kind of a walkway outside. Well here, there were just windows and you could open them up so the classrooms would stay cool. So I would uh, be standing up in front and, uh, and teaching them physics, and I would turn around and write something on the blackboard, and some of the students in the back would just hop out the windows and take off because they weren't interested in, in listening to physics. And then also they would take their ballpoint pens in the back and they would clip the little uh, pocket clips and, and make noise. And um, so there wasn't a, a strong interest from some of them in, in learning their education, uh, learning physics. But the, the courses in, in Pakistan, like a lot of other countries, your excellence depended upon your year-end tests. So you didn't really have to be in class every day and you didn't have to learn every day. But at the end of the year, you had to put it all together and take the final test and then pass or fail. And so that was very important. So it affected the way you, uh, you taught the class. The um, other aspect, another aspect was um, I was in a uh, English American mess. So there were three of us, uh, two British uh, guys and myself, and we hired a, um, a um, man from Afghanistan. He was about six foot two, six foot four, uh, I think was a Pashtu. And he, had a, he came from a village there and he cooked our meal every noon. And it was always a typical Pakistani meal. It was light on meat and uh, heavy on, on the curry and a lot of rice. And um, he uh, uh, cooked very well, disappeared about once a month to go, to go home. The other thing I remember about uh, Rawalpindi is um, how you felt close to the people because when you went out on the street, people uh, uh, virtually lived on the street or if they didn't, they had a house or something, the house was always open so you could see into their house, you could, you could see them eating, a lot of outdoor restaurants and a lot of, uh, they call them water wallies. These were guys who carried water around in big um, sacks and you could buy water from them. And um, as I said, a lot of sidewalk restaurants were set up and you could eat there. 
Another aspect was the beauty of uh, Pakistan. Uh, one Easter vacation, the British guy and, uh, and I went up into the mountains, in the Hindu Kush, at about 13,000, 14,000 feet into the snow and just into the back villages. And that was the most interesting part. People who hadn't seen Americans for, um, for years and years, the uh, town elders would invite you into the town square and they would feed you uh, fruit, uh, apricots and raisins and so forth that uh, they had grown themselves. And um, were, you know, very open to, uh, to your, your presence there. And uh, when, we, uh, when we flew in, we, we flew in uh, Nunga Purba, which is the second highest mountain in the, uh, in the Himalayas. And we were at about uh, 12 or 13,000 feet in the old DC-3, so there wasn't much pressurization. And uh, we were there for about four or five days. We were trying to get back home to uh, Rawalpindi, and we couldn't because the weather was socked in. So being in such an old airplane, DC-3, you had to wait for the weather, so we sat there up in the uh, mountains for about two or three days before we got home. But it was a very interesting experience meeting these uh, Pakistanis. And a lot of them up there, it was um, rumored to be that they were remnants of um, the Greek invasion back in, uh, from Alexander the Great. And indeed, some of the pictures I've taken, I still have, look like uh, just normal Greek uh, people and so they say they're enclaves of, of Pakistanis living in the mountains now, uh, direct descendants of uh, Alexander the Great. And also, you can go through the uh, the pass, the Khyber Pass, going into Kabul. I went over to Kabul one time, and as you drive through the pass, you can see all of the stones that have been etched by the various uh, invading armies that have put their uh, their signatures on there. And Kabul was very interesting too, walking around, and uh, I went up to visit an old fort, and these uh, Af Afghani soldiers were up there and started talking, and uh, they wanted to engage in a game of chess, so they invited me in to uh, play chess. I didn't play ch chess very well, but I sat there and, and uh, played chess, so that was an interesting thing. And uh, they had on the, they had on their, they, they put down their rugs as they manufactured the rugs on the sidewalks and uh, poured water on them. They just uh, allowed them to sit on the sidewalk and dry until they were ready to. Um, so that was the Persian rugs that the Afghanis uh, made. So that's what I remember about uh, teaching. That's really fascinating. Well, it was an interesting year.